Good morning, judges. My name is Second Class Billy, and these are my colleagues, Second Class Ethan Goldcamp, Second Class Leah Harder, and First Class Tanasha Matumbo. We are the United States Coast Guard Academy Cadet Ethics Team. Thank you very much for having us here today. We're really excited to present to you our assessment of the North Korean threat. So the bottom line up front is that we have assessed the North Korean threat to be credible and significant because we have seen an increase in North Korean cyber activity in the United States systems as well as our allies have seen the same increase. Um, we choose to assess this framework through the lens of just war theory, legal precedent, DOD cyber strategy, and the foreign affairs model of DIME. We, based on our assessment through this framework, we have assessed that we should, um, or we recommend that we should increase our uh, cyber action just short of loss of life, um, and we should, uh, uh, just short of loss of life. And through this, we, our ultimate goal should be diplomacy. So I'm going to run you through uh, a background on the case and then give you a basic explanation of cyber warfare. North Korea is currently increasing their cyber activity within our infrastructure. We see this in um, regards to earmark. So an earmark is basically a line of code that indicates the foreign adversary is present in your system. They're not permanent, but sometimes we can't locate all of them. So uh, most times these have trademarks related to certain entities. So North Korea we've identified as within these systems. Um, as far as our vulnerabilities go, our F-35 fighters and other newer aircraft potentially are compromised, as well as our, as well as our energy infrastructure. This is an escalation from what we've seen previously, and our allies, Japan and South Korea, have also seen this escalation. We find the information to be credible because we can see the, the earmarks in our systems, and our allies are also seeing this same escalation. Cyber warfare comes down to four phases. The first phase is probing. This is basically mapping the battle space, and we see this all the time. We're doing it all the time to both our friends and our enemies. Phase two is data exfiltration. This is essentially gathering data in regards to that space, in regards to PII, credentials, and passwords to give you access to more spaces. We're also doing this all the time to both our friends and our enemies. Phase three is exploitation. This is using the information that you have to build the back doors within a system that give you access and control um, in order to undermine the user's um, control of the system. So this would start locally um, and in small phases with like an opening and closing of a program to see how much you can get away with before the user notices. The last phase of this is an attack. An attack specifically and moving forward is in regards to loss of life. So if someone died due to an exploitation, we would consider that to be an attack. North Korea currently has um, presented the situation that we are in a late phase two, moving towards phase three. We're seeing an increase in earmarks, but not necessarily the building of a back door yet. And if it is there, we have not been able to identify it currently. Cyber action comes in two types. The first type is cyber-enabled espionage, and this is essentially um, gathering information in order to give yourself a better profile as to what your adversary might look like. So this could be something in regards to um, taking information or stealing battle plans, that type of thing. This is directly related to phase one and phase two of cyber warfare. Cyber-enabled sabotage has physical ramifications and targets specific infrastructure. Um, this would be um, in regards to looking at our electric power grids in specifics. And it's related directly to phase three and four of the cyber warfare continuum. So what do we see right now with our electric power grids? As far as our vulnerability, it comes down to the PLC, which is the interface in between the user and the machinery. Most of the systems we're going to talk about work in a very similar manner, where the PLC provides information to the user as to regards, um, in regards to how the machinery is operating. So if there was a hack within our PLCs, it might look like, um, specifically in like a municipal power grid, it would look like the user seeing the machinery is creating this much voltage, when in fact the machinery could be shutting down. This could potentially lead to blackouts um, and loss of power. Um, but not unlike what we see in the Northeast every year with terrible weather. And because of this, we know we have response plans in place in order to provide power to places that might be vulnerable to these types of attacks. Um, in regards to power generation, we could see a similar um, conceptually styled attack um, or exploitation in regards to systems um, having their PLCs being manipulated. Um, but our real concern in regards to attack to power generation would be in regards to nuclear. Um, if we did see an a exploitation in the nuclear field, um, we would assess that there's a low risk <coughs> because nuclear power is hard targets to hit. They have people um, scanning lines of code in order to uh, mitigate earmarks, and they have security measures in place to mitigate this type of attack.
In regards to the F-35s and other newer aircraft, their vulnerabilities are <laughs> chips that are in place in them, which are created from China. And the vulnerability there is because the chips, uh, that China knows how the chips work. So that information could be passed to North Korea. We don't know to what extent these assets are compromised, and we don't know to what severity. But we reverse engineer these chips when we have them. So that has already been mitigated um, within that aircraft. And as far as our uh, conventional warfare capacity goes, these are not assets that we are currently using because they're relatively new. So the extent to loss of life that we see is unlikely. So now that we have briefed to you our threat assessment, it's important to present the framework in which we'll be building our recommendations off of. Today, I'll present the DOD cyber strategy. Second class harder, we'll talk about the foreign affairs model of DIME. First class for Tumba, we'll talk about the ethical considerations of just war theory. And second class Dilly, we'll talk about the legal precedent of this case. So jumping right into it, uh, in 2018, the DOD cyber strategy has stated five cyber goals that we want to hit. The first being build and maintain uh, cyber forces and capabilities. Goal number two, Build, uh, defend DOD networks and data. Goal number three, be prepared to defend the U.S. homeland. Goal number four, build and maintain viable cyber options. And goal number five, build and maintain robust international alliances. And within goal number five, there was an emphasis on our Northeast Asian and Asian Pacific allies, uh, exemplifying the fact that we acknowledge that North Korea is such a threat uh, in the cyber arena. Our second lens is going to be through the political affairs model of Don. So because our end goal is diplomacy, we're going to use our information, military, and economics in order to get to the negotiating table. As far as information goes, there's a lot about North Korean infrastructure that is concealed to us, but any action that we take will provide information to North Korea in regards to how we wish to proceed with this case. Military, we have military superiority over North Korea, but any military action we take will have potential consequences upon South Korea and other neighboring allies. So that's something we need to take into consideration. Economics, the economic sanctions that have put on North Korea are historically ineffective, but this is another area in which we can apply pressure in, in, um, in hopes of pushing North Korea to the negotiating table to come to a conclusion. Our third lens we'll be using is through an ethical framework, and that's in just war theory. This is an estimate or a criteria used to justify, first, can we even enter this war? And that is ad bellum. So the first portion of ad bellum is that us as the United States are a legitimate, recognized authority in the international community. So being said that, the second portion of the ad bellum is that when we declare war, we decide that we are going to enter this conflict, that we can either declare war either to a state government, a group of individuals, or just a specific individual themselves. Following forward, we have right intention, being that if we enter this conflict, the peace that we achieve has to be far significant than if we would have had no conflict at all. Uh, moving forward from there, we have just cause, in that we have the ability to right a wrong or an injury suffered. From there, we have a probability of success, that we have to assess that if we enter this conflict, can we be successful, can we win? This cannot be a hopeless cause. From there on, we have proportionality, being that the amount of force that we use has to be proportional to whatever wrong or injury that we received. And then lastly, we have uh, last resort being that if we go through our dime aspect or through our DOD strategy and we see that it is not working to achieve diplomacy, then we can finally apply some type of force. So after we go through ad bellum and we decide that yes, we can enter this just war uh, conflict, then we are in bellum, meaning that how can we function in a manner that it remains ethical in every decision that we make? The first aspect of this is distinction, being that we have to identify the combatants and non-combatants. Now this is a very gray area because of cyber warfare being that they don't have to use uh, the government infrastructure to hack us. We can have um, contractors or individuals who most likely will be working in an arena that is close to civilians, and that can be a very dark and gray area that we have to make sure that is very clear for us. The second portion in Bellow is proportionality, recognizing that the force we use has to be proportional to our military objectives. And then lastly is the uh, military necessity piece, being that the force that we use has to be proportional or a necessity to acquire our military objectives. The fourth lens that we build a recommendation off of is the legal precedent. So the legal aspect has, or the, the legal aspect of our recommendation has, has three different parts. The first is the law of armed conflict, which outlines exactly what countries can and cannot do in times of warfare. With regard to cyber warfare, there is no specific outline as to what cyber warfare looks like between countries. Um, so because of this, we have to follow the laws of armed conflict, um, but we do, but even though there's no specificity. The second part is that the NATO Article 5. NATO Article 5 outlines that if any of the NATO allies go to war, um, the rest of the NATO allies will support the first country's invocation of NATO Article 5. With regard to cyber warfare, this is contingent upon that loss of life. 
The third aspect of this is because the laws of armed conflict and NATO Article 5 do not specifically outline cyber warfare, we follow the customary law, which is where there is no clear and concrete guidance. Customary law comes from a precedent set, set in the international community, which for the realm of cyber warfare, there are three distinct events. The first event is North Korea attacks on Sony, which is a Japanese media company. Uh, essentially, they shut down and sabotaged a movie that Sony was about to release. Um, the FBI conducted an investigation and found that it was North Korea based on similarities to previously developed North Korean malware, um, IP addresses that are linked to known North Korean infrastructure, and um, similarities to previous uh, sabotages on South Korean banks and media outlets. The second event that we see in the international community is the Stuxnet virus. The Stuxnet virus was essentially aimed at the uh, PLC, as second class Harder spoke about earlier, where it caused the machinery or the centrifuges to spin out of control. Meanwhile, any of the users saw that everything was functioning as normal. The key aspect to this is that Iran did not declare this to be an act of war and in response up their cyber capacity. The third and most important event that we see in the international community with cyber warfare is the Estonian cyber threat. In 2007, the Estonian government announced that they were going to be taking down statues of Soviet Union leaders in Estonia. And in response, they were, um, their government websites and bank websites were sabotaged and shut down. Estonia claimed this was an act of cyber warfare and blamed Russia for this attack, but the response from the international community was that it was not cyber warfare because there was no loss of life and because they could not um, attribute the attacks to Russia. So the culminating aspect of all three of these cases is that it, for it to be an act of warfare, it is contingent upon a loss of life. Moving forward, it is important to note that any action or lack thereof that we take um, against North Korea is setting another event in legal precedent for cyber warfare. So if we were going to uh, carry out a cyber attack on North Korea that would lead to loss of life, uh, it would fall under three categories in which we can analyze through just war theory. That's preventative, preemptive, and retaliatory. Starting with retaliatory, if North Korea attacked the United States or our allies, we would be morally justified to respond with equal or slightly greater force. However, in this case, North Korea has not carried out such an attack, so therefore retaliatory action uh, does not apply. Moving into preemptive, if we've assessed that there is an imminent crippling attack coming from North Korea, we uh, are morally justified to defend ourselves and strike first. However, it's important that we break down what imminent is. And so there are three categories that need to be satisfied for us to determine that a threat is imminent. And that's intent, capability, and action. First of all, we understand that North Korea has intent. If the international community has acknowledged that the United States is an enemy or North Korea sees uh, the United States as an enemy. Second, we've assessed that they do have a capability. They're increased in cyber action, as well as the possible building of back doors into our critical infrastructure could ultimately be exploited, and therefore they have a capability. However, finally, there's been no action that has put them in place to actually carry out a strike on our, on our country or on our allies that would lead to loss of life. And that's because, as we presented earlier, we are in late stage two of data exfiltration. And that is something that everyone in the international community is doing all the time. We do this to our friends as well as our enemies. And so therefore, North Korea has not carried out an action that will uh, lead to loss of life in the United States. Therefore, we are not justified to strike preemptively. That means any attack we carry out on North Korea will be completely in a preventative manner, saying that we see North Korea as a threat. There's no imminent attack on the horizon, but we prefer to fight now rather than later. However, preventative strikes are not supported legally under the law of armed conflict and are not supported uh, morally under just war theory. So therefore, we are not justified to strike North Korea preventatively. But just because we can't engage in a cyber attack doesn't mean that we can't do anything. As far as um, proportionality goes, we can match North Korea's presence within their electric power grids. So their, their systems are vulnerable in the same way, ways that ours are, meaning that the PLC really is um, a, manner, uh, a mechanism that we can use to our advantage. So we can build back doors, we can get into the PLC to the point where we could exploit it, um, but not take that final step that would result in loss of life. North Korea does not have the backup infrastructure that we have. And if we lost power, we would be able to handle that type of situation. But North Korea does not have that. So we cannot predict what the loss of life would be if we shut down an electric power grid. So it's important to remember, though, that North Korea will see these earmarks in their systems. They will see that the United States is there. And that will apply pressure to them in a manner that will cause them to come to the negotiating table because they don't want to experience loss of life in the same way that we do. This is another mechanism that we can use to apply pressure um, to encourage negotiation. There's other uh, 
policy that we're already taking that we can encourage um, and build upon. So particularly increasing our cyber-enabled espionage from North Korea to build up our information in order to have a better sense of what their capacity is or what a cyber attack could look like coming from North Korea. And also uh, making sure that our pipelines of information are effective between all of the United States agencies and making sure the information uh, between DOD, DHS, Promise is getting to the right people to handle this current situation. For military, we can begin to reach out to our NATO allies, informing them of the situation and garner support for any conventional or cyber action we may ultimately have to take. Uh, we can also restrict our compromised military assets. We, uh, we acknowledge that this is not a permanent solution. However, it does buy us time to fully assess the threat and take out our uh, possibly compromised military assets. And then finally, uh, increase cyber protection and training, as well as update our outdated systems. Tying this back with our DOD cyber strategy, this is something that we're constantly doing, and we should keep this up so we can train our personnel to look for these earmarks and wipe them out, as well as maintain or build a more resilient infrastructure. In regards to economics, the United States needs to continue its current sanctions on North Korea and support the UN sanctions in regards to the textile exports within North Korea, which is one of their chief um, economic suppliers. And we also need to work um, on pressuring China to adhere to sanctions. They currently don't, and they're one of the major economic partners with North Korea, which is what hinders most of our sanctions. And so applying pressure to China is critical in ensuring that we are applying uh, a comprehensive strategy in order to push North Korea to the negotiating table. With our recommendations, there are a lot of benefits, but then there are minimal risks. The first benefit is that we're supporting our NATO allies in trying to bring North Korea to the negotiation table to not um, increase tensions in the region. Uh, we are entirely supported by precedent in the international community as we are not, um, comp we are not advocating for an attack against North Korea. Uh, there is low risk of loss of life as any of our infrastructure uh, that went down, we are able to transport power to and mitigate the risks. The proportionality is there because this is what North Korea is doing to us and we are simply doing it to them to put pressure on them to bring them to the negotiating table. Further, this is prepping the battle space for any future engage engagement with North Korea if uh, retaliation was necessary in the future. And it encourages diplomacy because it is putting that pressure on them to bring them to the North Korea, to, to bring them to the negotiating table because they don't want to experience the loss of life that we could incur. Um, the risks here are that we might have earmarks in our systems that we are not aware of, and they could choose to exploit these if we are building more backdoors into their systems. Um, we could experience a loss of power, but the United States infrastructure has the ability to transport that power, and we have very robust response teams to anything that might happen in the United States. Um, we might experience some military assets going down, but a second class gold camp talked about earlier, um, we would be able to pull these assets offline and triage them in order to uh, mitigate that risk. And the third is that it might impact our allies in the region. North Korea might decide to retaliate against South Korea or Japan. So moving forward, we have to understand that we've presented here today a set of solutions, a set of frameworks, both in the international realm as well as in our own foreign policy and DOD strategy, as long as the uh, universal ethical means of adjusting or addressing war. But this is not a one-dimensional interaction between the United States or North Korea. These are the stakeholders we have up there who are experiencing espionage as well as sabotage in the cyber warfare frame. So what we have to understand is that whatever decision we do make or come to conclude, whether we do move to some type of action or no action at all, there will be a historical, legal, and international precedent set in the cyber warfare realm. Thanks so much for your time. All right. Um, very good job, guys. Thank you. And, uh, for the question round, you'll, um, they'll be anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, and I strongly encourage you to try and be as concise as you can be. I understand that a lot of these questions get complex. If I feel like you're drolling on, and uh, if you've been on the same question for too long, I'll ask you to stop, and we'll get moving so that all the judges, or at least most of them, can get a question in. So with that, um, I'll start the timer when the judges start their questions. Uh, let me understand something now at the risk of perhaps oversimplifying your position on this, um, what you seem to be saying is, let's continue to get ready, but let's not do anything until something happens to us. Is that right? No preemptive action, no preventative action, and, and certainly no uh, prevention. So, um, you uh, not necessarily do nothing, though. So, we can't take any action that would be perceived as cyber warfare, um, but
but right now that definition is contingent upon the loss of life. So we can take any action up until that point of loss of life, but anything that succeeds that would be a completely preventative manner because we don't um, anticipate an imminent strike from North Korea. So you're adhering to the just theory of war that requires aggression and loss of life uh, before we would take action? Yes, sir. In this scenario, they have international teams overseas uh, that are potentially conducting attacks. What what is the uh, what is your the status of those personnel, and can you legally and ethically roll them up, attack or kill them? So by they you mean the United States has international? No, no. There are no, for the scenario there are North Korean teams located around the world overseas in little clandestine cells that are likely conducting or about to conduct attacks. So what is the status of those teams? Are they guerrillas? Are they cyber warriors? Are they, are they just hackers? Are they criminals? And, and then what are our options? Can we roll them up and kill them? If they conduct cyber warfare. Sir, so uh, let me uh, start answering your question. Hopefully my teammates also pick it up uh, anything that I say. But uh, actually, as of right now, uh, we understand that a lot of these hackers or are actually contractors and not necessarily um, directly underneath North Korea and are actually in China. And we actually recognize there is actually a building, speaking to some of our cyber experts, um, that actually has the contractors working alongside civilians um, as well. And the United States actually has arrested uh, a number of them in previous years. Um, so to say that, again, it's the ethical confusion and in bello of making sure we understand that what are combatants and non-combatants, and how can we isolate the situation so that civilians aren't injured, but it seems like we are successful because we are arresting these contractors, and um, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say the guerrilla warfare uh, in the sense, but that they operate separately outside of the framework of government of North Korea, but they are in support of the North Korean regime. And um, that's, that, that's the ethical standpoint of that in some history. Um, it, it is murky, but if they're not, what you're telling me is they're non-combatants executing combatant activities. <laughs> Gray area, sir. A cyber mercenary. Or uh, mercenaries, in which case, sir, what's their so status relative to our yeah. use of force? Well, I would say, as based on how we've assessed this case, the, the capabilities that they have, um, would not lead to a significant loss of life within the United States, but would be dangerous to say, based upon historical precedent, that they would be carrying out cyber warfare, based on what we believe that they can do at this moment. So, okay. well, I'm not arguing. <laughs> I wanted to understand how you thought about it. Thank you. We were talking about <clears throat> the. Uh, North Korean regime being uh, uh, sensitive to loss of life in one of the uh, takedowns, I guess, of the uh, power plant, whatever it might be, that, that would uh, cause loss of life. Do you really, uh, do we really think that the North Korean leadership has the welfare of the people uh, placed higher than our own regime change? And, and like, what's the, what's the threshold? So I. I would perceive that they don't, because the most important thing to the Kim regime is staying in power. But it's important to distinguish here um, uh, a loss suffered based on people and a loss suffered based on infrastructure. So taking down an electric, an electric power grid could potentially resolve loss of life in North Korea, but it's also an attack on an infrastructure, um, which undermines the capability and the credibility of the regime, because they're perceived to be this, um, this, um, oh, my God, the, the godlike uh, leader that, that has no flaws. And so if they can't protect their own people, that is undermined. And that is going to undermine the Kim regime's ability to maintain control of their country. And they don't want to experience that. But the, uh, the intention is not to get to that point of exploitation, which would lead to North Korean loss of life, because that would be unjust, based on the just war theory. So any pressure that we can apply to bring them to the negotiating table is what we find to be the best course of action to take um, in handling this situation so it doesn't result in um, global consequences. And also, if they, even if they don't necessarily value that about their own people, it's a platform that they can use to justify any response that they do. So if they incurred a loss of life, the rest of the international community sees that as ju like a justification to go to war. So even if they don't necessarily care about their people, it's still a platform that they could use to justify going to war with us. We don't want to give them that. 
you focused on your, your approach on, on cyber warfare. Do you see any, any threat from North Korea to us or our allies, uh, particularly South Korea, based on the actions day to day in North Korea? Are you speaking specifically in a conventional manner? Yeah. Well, conventional or non conventional? Or weapons of mass destruction? I mean, I think the entire world would assess that North Korea is a potential threat. And we, uh, it's agreed upon that there's some kind of um, action that needs to be taken in order to mitigate North Korea. But also, we're still under these, these legal international moral precedents that have been set. So we cannot take action just for the sake of mitigating a threat now because it's not imminent. Also because, uh, back to what Second Class Goal Camp said about what exactly an imminent threat is, uh, we recognize that they have some type of negative uh, approach to us, that's one, as well as they have some type of capability, whether through cyber or conventional, to cause damage. But as of right now, and this is very certain for South Korea, Japan, and our allies, um, there isn't any movement that is uh, the third step of saying something will occur. And now two out of three is what kind of steps us back. Well, uh, there's an answer to that. When uh, President Trump goes to talk to Kim, uh, what uh, advice would you give the president to minimize any current threats you see from North Korea? That we don't want to give them the perception that we are planning to do anything to them. We don't want them to see that third. It's the same um, concept with us. They, we, it's known that we aren't a huge fan of North Korea. It's known that we have the capacity to do something. So if we go that step further and show that we are looking at doing something, that would be a reason for them to get us. So my advice to President Trump would be to not show that we are looking at doing anything to uh, cause a conflict, whether in the cyber realm or conventional war. Well, would, yeah, would uh, President Trump ask them to uh, not carry out some of these uh, threats that we think, cyber threats or any other threats that we think they're doing right now, or any preparations? I think with the, the nature of cyber where everyone is always probing and everyone is always using data exfiltration, expecting North Korea to stop those actions when we would continue to do it would be unfair. But they haven't moved to, but they haven't moved to the point of exploitation yet, so we can't justify telling them to stop doing something that they're not currently doing. They're still in the phase one, phase two stage. This case said that there was an imminent threat. It's getting worse every day. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to ask you kind of a question to bring it down to the deck play level, because this is very international relations level of the case. So you guys are going to be junior officers in you know, one to three years, right? So, um, you brought up the F-35 as potentially exploited, exploitable because the chips come from China. So I guess I'm going to put you in this. See an Air Force officer maybe here. Um, one of your pilots is going out to fly a mission. And you know that his F-35 is compromised. There's nothing you can do about it. You still have to fly the mission. You can't correct the cyber exploitation that's possible within his jet. You tell him. Ooh, So you can look at this from a couple of ethical perspectives. I'm thinking specifically conflict means to an end. Um, I would not feel good about sending someone up there without telling them. But I do think that it's core in a lot of our service members is the need to go out even if there is a threat. But I do believe we would take any mitigating action possible to not send them up in that specific fighter. Because we do know that we're, like, the fighters aren't online yet because they're still being developed. And it's all of our newer aircraft, so we're mostly using still like F-16s, F-18s, F-22s. They're not even aircraft, like aircraft carriers ready. So the likelihood of that asset being exploited, it would happen years from now. Potentially, that's that's going to be the most detrimental for them to do it now to us. I mean, technically, my my hypothetical, I fast forward is you guys right. being yes. O fives and O fours, right? I I would not feel comfortable sending someone to That's yeah. my 
I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I just want to know how you review and think about it. As an extension to your question, sir. Oh, we'll, we'll debate that one. <laughs> as, as an extension to <laughs> uh, that question, um, I think it definitely is a Kantian and also recognizing that um, he's not the end to our mission, but a means to acquire that piece at the end. And I can actually bring that down to uh, Coast Guard level and uh, um, going out to the water. Um, Coast Guard is a service that uh, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. And we understand that our radar navigation can be compromised and that some boats are incapable of handling certain waves. But when you need to call and rescue life, um, that our end is not our sailors. They're the means to make sure that we rescue lives. So that's how I would receive that question. Thanks. Right, gentlemen, we have time if you need it. Otherwise, um, we can wrap it up if you want. I had a follow-up, I guess. We talked about loss of life as being the definition of an SOS cup for how you were to use okay. it, of an attack. Um, fairly recent history, the Iranians have captured that young man and then they gave him back an horrible saving knife like a week after we got him back. So that was technically loss of life, right? So was that an act of war on the Iranians' part? He was an American civilian, he wasn't even a combatant. I would say it kind of depends on the, like, I, I'm not familiar with the, the like, I know the general case. idea, but the, the whole extent of the case. So it kind of depends on why he went over there, what happened to make them capture him, and, and what happened in subsequent stuff. I think he was a hiker, and they just picked him up. I think that was a hiker. They accused him of a Traditionally, with precedent in those types of cases, it has not been perceived as a manner of warfare. Um, and so on that, I would fall back on precedent saying that's particularly why I was assume we didn't engage in warfare based on that conventional or cyber. Um, but in regards to cyber warfare specifically, because it's still this gray area where no one has yet died from a cyber attack. And so that's where the line has currently been drawn, and so that's what we have to work with, in particular to our case. But in that case, I would fall back in precedent, the same way that we did here, to that traditionally when that type of thing happens, because it, it has happened before. Mm -hmm. We haven't gone to war over it. Okay. So Thanks. it happened with no, they yeah. happen in North Korea, too. They That's why. Yeah. So, and journalists and ISIS. Yeah. So. It happens before, and we haven't gone to war over it. So. Okay, I can't, I can't leave it with, <laughs> okay. you tell them, and then you order them to watch. Because the mission, just what you said, mission first. And you wouldn't be ordering the launch on the mission if it wasn't worth the risk and loss of life anymore. There's always other risks, right? Right. There's other sure. risks, but... Further, because we know that that's a problem that can happen, I think their training would cover that it is a possibility, so they would probably already be aware. Yeah, I know the F-35 has a system that's <laughs> switched to manual or something. I'm confident that most of our military personnel would still take on that. Okay. Because we do it every day. We know our job is to receive. What should we do? What should we do? What values? Yes. Yeah. Now, here's a fundamental question for you, Coast Guard, one minute, Coast Guard guys. Do they still teach celestial navigation at the Coast Guard Academy? Yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes. We actually learned it in a planetarium very similar to what we were in this morning. We are all having you know, flashbacks. You know, this place, <laughs> this place cut it out for many years, and now they're teaching it again. I guess they decided that those satellites could go down at some point. And, we oh, no, no GPS. What do I do now? We also learned how to physically do it when we were on Eagle over our second or third class summer. So Very good. Yeah. A lot of our YP degrees are going to make mistakes so much. Sure. Mm -hmm. just, for just to make sure you know how to do it. Do it on Eagle. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Coast Guard. And that's all we need from you right now. Feel free to 